Now, I'd like to introduce uh, today's Founders Memorial Lecturer. The Founders Memorial Award was established in 1958 to honor the memory of scientists who made outstanding contributions to entomology. This year, it is my pleasure to introduce my longtime friend, Dr. Thomas Baker, distinguished professor of entomology and chemical ecology at Penn State University, and he has been selected to deliver the Founders Memorial Award lecture in honor of Dr. Harry Shorey. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Baker. Well, it's an honor and a privilege, to say the least, to be able to stand up here and talk about a great man, Harry Shorey. He's a true founder in the Entomological Society of America. I want to try to tell you how exciting it was to be doing research back in the 1970s and 80s, uh, stimulated by Harry Shorey's innovative, imaginative research. I want to tell you what it was like back then when there were very few pheromones that had been identified. And each new pheromone that came out, you could try to see if you could manipulate the insect's behavior, either to get them to go into traps or to do what Harry Shorey is well known for, mating disruption. I want to tell you how I came up with the title for this talk, Love at First Sniff. Harry Shorey, well, Harry is really a founder in two major areas uh, in, the, in the field of insect sex pheromones. First of all, he was an innovator, pioneer in using pheromones to try to control insect pests through mating disruption, sex pheromone mating disruption. Uh, he's a little lesser known, but to most of us who have worked in this field, really well known as one of the pioneers in understanding sex pheromone mediated behavior. He really made sure that he would watch the insects, whether it was females calling or males responding to pheromone. And his innovative experiments really paved the way to the whole field of neuroethology of pheromone mediated behavior under linking the behavior with neuronal pathways uh, that are involved in olfaction. <laughs> yeah, that one doesn't work. So 1991, I gave the plenary address in uh, Reno, and it was about communication. And I think today it's, that was the theme of the meeting then, communication. And today it's still about communication and what Harry did in understanding insect sex pheromone communication systems. When I gave that talk, and in this photo, this was a paper that came out of that talk, the, uh, I'm sitting in Harry Shorey's chair, and behind me are Harry Shorey's books, and I worked in Harry Shorey's lab to do so many of the experiments that I did that got my career off to a great start. I want to tell you how that came about. First of all, I really owe my career to these two amazing men, Wendell Roloffs and Ring Carday. I got a great start in Wendell's lab as a technician in 1972, and then I got my master's with him at Cornell in 75. Then I went, got my PhD with Ring Carday in his lab when he moved to Michigan State. And all during that time, I remember how amazing it was to be in a coffee break and then we would be saying, did you see Shorey's latest paper? Unbelievable. It would be every week, every month, we'd be sitting around looking at what Shorey had come up with. Some amazingly creative things that we, we couldn't imagine. How did, how did he think of doing this? He thought of things that nobody else had thought of doing. And was always with behavior or female calling behavior or male response behavior. And it was like, maybe not many of you were uh, back there in the 60s, like, uh, like I was, but when the music group, the Beatles, came out with a new album, it was like, wow, you had to put it on, you had to listen, amazing, look at that. How did they come up with that? To me, uh, at, at that young age, uh, it, and being new in the field, it was, I was just astounded 
It was so fun to see what new, go to the library and open the journal and see what new thing Harry Shorey came out with. It was just like that, really vibrant. Then I came back from Rings Lab to postdoc back in Wendell's lab in 1978 and 79. And amazingly, it was like the sky opened up and the news came that Harry Shorey, at the peak of his career, had quit, had retired from his job, resigned, and had moved up to Washington State to grow flowers. That's what we had heard. And he completely left the University of California. And we were saying, what happened? We didn't know. But it opened the door for me, so I applied for his old job, and I got it. I was hired as assistant professor at UC Riverside. So it was like they hadn't moved a thing. It was like Harry Shorey had st st stood up from his chair, put his pencil down, and just walked out. He left all his photographs there. He left all his reprints. He left all of his books. His lab was completely intact. He left two graduate students there. Uh, <laughs> that's not why he left, I think, but some people might have said. But uh, so I walked in, and there were, there were all of his reprints, and I'm sitting in his chair over there, like I said. And I was determined to save all of that stuff separately. I had my own stuff, and I kept his reprints, his books, separate from mine, because I thought that someday maybe Harry Shorey would come back from growing flowers in Washington, and then I could give him those things back because he might want them. Harry Shorey, if you read uh, so many of his writings and his review articles and chapters, he really was, from the start, dedicated to understanding the rudiments of insect behavior in order to try to manipulate that behavior. That was the essence of, of who he was. His goal was to manipulate insect behavior using pheromones or other semiochemicals or anything. And in the bottom of this paragraph, he says, the identification of a chemical should open the door to more necessary research to determine whether the normal behavior of insects can be interfered with and manipulated to our advantage. I reached out to some of his old postdocs and graduate students, and they are old, I have to say. They, uh, to the person, said what a great guy Harry was and how easy it was to, to work with him. And this uh, snippet said uh, this person liked Harry the minute I met him. Casual, very friendly, always interested in us, and I never remember a moment when he seemed angry and it likened him to uh, Wendell Roloff's in that regard. Optimistic, glass half full. And he always had uh, lab meetings, he invited students to his house with a case of Coors on the floor to stimulate discussions. Harry graduated from University of Massachusetts uh, in 1953. He went, entered the Army and the Medical Corps as a first lieutenant in Korea. 55 through 59, he got his master's and PhD at Cornell. And then in 1959, he was hired as a junior entomologist at UC Riverside, a citrus agricultural experiment station. By 1970, he was already a full professor. 1970, he hooded his first PhD student, Tom Payne, who, if you want to hear a lot of amazing Harry Shorey stories that I can't tell up here. Go uh, have a beer or two with Tom Payne. Uh, but I caution you, they're, they're, some of them are really R-rated. But Tom uh, spoke so highly of, of Harry. Tom did uh, a lot of EAG studies, the, some of the first EAGs. Not the first, uh, actually Andre Camo and Wendell Roloffs did those first for, for Moaz. But he tells a great story of when he was thinking of going to UC Santa Barbara, he got wind of the fact that uh, this guy at Riverside might have an opening uh, for a master's student. So 
he and his wife were driving around, but during the drive, he read a Reader's Digest article um, about moths and bats, three pages. So he gets into Harry's office, and Harry leans back in, uh, leans back in his chair, like Tom says he always did, and said, uh, well, I'm thinking of uh, having a person work on uh, bat ultrasound as a way of disrupting uh, pests on crops. And so Tom <laughs> just, he was very, very lucky. Then he impressed Harry with this little Reader's Digest thing that he had uh, written. He said he never told Harry the truth about how he knew so much about bats <laughs> until after he graduated. <laughs> Harry became uh, head of the Division of Biological Control at UC Riverside. He came back to uh, the University of California, as you'll hear uh, later in this talk, 1996 this was. So when he was a junior entomologist from 1959 to 64, he had, it was very prolific, mostly on papers having to do with insecticides uh, on vegetable crops. And it was during this early time that he, uh, I'm going to see what time it is here. Okay. That he started working on sex pheromones. And this is what led to him being such a pioneer in this area and a contributor, a founder. I've circled this Roman numeral one. Can you believe the gumption this guy had on his first paper on sex pheromones of noctuid moths? He puts a Roman numeral one. Like there's going to be a lot of other ones to follow. This is when on a trichoplusine, the pheromone wasn't even known yet. Um, there was only two pheromones known at this time for moths, and one of them was bogus the gypsy moth pheromone, Giplor, and the other one was Bombix mori, 1959. So here it is, 1964, and he's going to bioassay and identify the cabbage looper pheromone, so he has this. 1966, he's already up to paper Roman numeral nine. He's working with Roy Facuto and Lyle Gaston, and I point out this is one of the first uh, probably in the United States, uses of a com combined GC behavioral bioassay. They shunted 10% of the GC effluent out to a cage of moths, teeny males, to see if they would respond. And you can see the peak uh, behavioral response to a certain peak in these uh, tracings. First ones. He's already up to 14. And here in 1967 already, now Bob Berger beat him to the punch in 1966 identifying the uh, cabbage looper pheromone. So, okay, Harry takes it and he says, I'm going to use it, Z712 acetate. He demonstrated uh, in this paper that you could disrupt uh, mating with a pheromone in the field, cabbage looper. He then went and publicized this with a paper in Nature showing the promise of pheromones for disrupting, inhibiting sex pheromone communications in moths. It's 1967 already, and only two pheromones had ever been identified, and he's using one of them to try to get pest control. A lot of papers, tons of papers here having to do with the biology of female calling, male response, coming up with new ways to measure the behavioral response, innovative assays. It was always about assays and understanding behavior, male, female. Wind velocity, what effect does that have? Temperature, age of males and females. He had tons of papers on circadian rhythms, how that affects the up and down, the behavioral response in female calling, and amazing. By 1972, here he is, up to 30, 30, 31, 32, all on different experiments in the field for mating disruption of Lepidoptera. And there were lots of others I'm not even listing here. And M John McLaughlin was a key player in these studies, and John might even be here in the audience, I don't know. But uh, John uh, spoke so highly of Harry in a letter to me. 
looking, you don't understand how tough it was to do these experiments, how expensive it is, and to get the fields and to get the, uh, all of the equipment in order. This was a key paper as we look back on it. He wasn't satisfied to show that, well, you know, you can disrupt mating, you know, putting the, the pheromone in the field in densely packed uh, uh, dispensers and, and tightly distributed. He decided, well, let's see how widely apart you can space them and still get the same effect. And this is incredible, 200 meters and 400 meters apart between the dispensers. And they still got effective mating disruption. And this was lost to many of us in the field at that time. We didn't know how important it, it was. So by 1972, I forgot to say, he was already up to almost 90. He had 88 papers by 1972, most of them on these pheromone and many on pheromone mating disruption. Now on the East Coast at that time, there was some young buck named Wendell Roloff, 1965, who was hired at Geneva. His picture was taken in 1967. And his charge was to identify pheromones that were uh, for tortricid moth pests in uh, New York orchards. This was Wendell's lab, many of the key players, Ada Hill, who was instrumental in identifying so many. So the East Coast part of this pheromone mafia was all involved with isolation and identification of, of pheromone chemicals. And Harry on the West Coast was more about taking those chemicals and using them. So they made a really nice team such that whenever they went to meetings and they gave talks together, they considered themselves a, the traveling road show with or without alcohol, I'm not sure, but there's a little bit there. The excitement of pheromones in the mid-1970s was amazing because in the New York Times, they came out with this huge article, and this was based on the findings of Dave Wood, Milt Silverstein, Wendell Roloff, Harry Shorey, all were funded for five years straight by the Rockefeller Foundation, which had really stimulated a ton of good research. And they came up with uh, this newspaper article, and then a book, big book uh, having to do with this too. And this was all about using pheromones various ways, and it was very exciting. Dave Wood uh, did mass trapping with the bark beetles uh, on the West Coast. Um, Harry, of course, with his mating disruption. Wendell with reducing insecticides by 50% in New York orchards when you uh, monitor the pests and time your sprays properly. And Mill Silverstein identifying uh, amazing new pheromone molecules. And this quote from that article tells it all. Despite all of this stuff that research he did and all these papers he published, he says it would be an empty feeling to have done this work for so long just as a scientific game. That says it all. That's what this guy was working for, the mating disruption. He was a big, he argued with the EPA over the regulations and how stringent they were and how unfair they were for these soft chemicals that were, he wanted to replace toxic insecticides. And he was instrumental along with Wendell and others in arguing for an exemption to tolerance uh, by the EPA to not having to do the full toxicology test because these compounds had been shown already to have an LD50 that was so high you couldn't measure it. These moth pheromones, you, to kill a rat, you pretty much had to drown the rat in pheromone. So they had no LD50s and EPA said, well, you have no LD50s, you can't. Anyway, they argued, it was like a, catch-22, and they were successful, and EPA eventually did give exemption to tolerance. Then Harry's lab, along with help from Milt Silverstein, identified correctly now, they had been doing pink bollworm disruption with a half, let me just say, a half-assed um, kind of mimic of the pheromone. Nobody knew what it really was, but they got the right pheromone with Milt Silverstein's help, and immediately Harry went out and was trying to really now disrupt pink bollworm, a scourge of, of, agri of cotton in, the, in, the, uh, in uh, California. And he did, this paper rocked the pheromone world. Sci another paper in science, he had zillions of papers in science and nature. He showed, and his lab showed 
with thousands uh, of acres of, of cotton that you could reduce the damage to the cotton balls in pheromone disruption plots that were equal or to or lower the damage level that you got with conventional insecticide spray program. That's to the left. And on the right, they demonstrated a severe reduction in the use of sprays in the pheromone uh, treated plots. Now the growers would only, sp they were allowed to spray if they saw that they needed to and they didn't need to. In these plots. This was the demonstration first ever that the pheromones could control insect populations. This led to the first ever registration of a pheromone for insect mating disruption anywhere in the world. And Conrail, Bill Brooks, and, uh, and uh, Chuck Doan and others at Conrail who worked, they got these hollow fibers registered and they called it Nomate P PBW. Now I got to Harry's lab, Harry's old lab, and uh, with the faculty there, and before I got there, 78, I, would all, I was already hearing, we were all hearing rumblings like, oh, well, you know, Harry, there's all this undercurrent of negativism. Well, you don't know, you know, they didn't, you're not seeing the data that didn't work, and there's all, there's all these people put, poking holes and undercutting these, these great findings. And I didn't realize why that was happening until I got to Riverside. And I saw from some of his own colleagues in uh, the former uh, Division of Economic Entomology, he jumped ship early on when he went into pheromones and switched from that division into the Division of Toxicology and Physiology. And there were some longstanding resentments. And these cotton entomologists, uh, I saw firsthand how negative they were and they took every chance to undercut and, and speak uh, negatively about uh, Shorey and his research. This just tells me what a strong man he was and how he, much he believed in his mission to do this because he was getting um, shot at from his, within his own department and he kept going, showed tremendous strength. And to the point where this negativism had spread around the world J.S. Kennedy, who was the commander of the British Empire, uh, almost knighted, and he was the discoverer of optimotor and taxes in 1939 in yellow fever mosquitoes. mosquitoes. He, I had a lot of correspondence with him during these early days in, in, uh, in Riverside. And he's on a panel in Europe evaluating how much they should go forward with mating disruption in England and Europe. And he wanted to be, tell the right story. And he wrote, and he says, we, we get conflicting reports about this mating disruption. There's very positive by Conrail and uh, all these really positive data. But on the other hand, I hear from visiting Americans that there are serious criticisms of the evaluations. And therefore, doubts about the value of the technique allegedly emanating from your own department at Riverside. So I knew where this was coming out for these old resentments, and I knew how Harry had had to persevere. And I wrote John Kennedy back and told him um, the, about the positive results and how they were true, they were valid. The other part of Harry's contribution that it was kind of an interesting story, how he stimulated with his research a whole new avenue of research by other labs on uh, moth, uh, how male moths fly up a pheromone plume and find the female. This has led over decades now to neuroethology that links the responses of the visual system, the optic lobe, and as coupled with the olfactory system and all the olfactory pathways and how that relates to behavior. And you can't do all this neuroethology if you don't know the behavior. Harry was the one who started this, this kind of in-flight maneuvering of males. Now it turns out his experiments, he was wrong, which is amazing, but I tip my hat to him because he was the first to actually try this. And he took a, a guess at this stuff and it wasn't exactly correct, he was kind of correct. So he built a wind tunnel 
Now, nobody in the United States before this had used a wind tunnel to look at moth male pheromone mediated behavior. It just didn't happen. 1972, they thought we're going to build a wind tunnel. And he got moths to fly up wind uh, in a pheromone plume. You're looking down on this zigzag track of the moth in the plume and saw how many times they were able to fly through that, that uh, hoop that's in the uh, left-hand frame of the wind tunnel, that square. They could fly, they were scored as, as a positive score if they went through that hoop. Then you got Moz to start flying upwind, and they thought, he and Stan Farkas thought, to put baffles right at the end of the wind tunnel, stop the wind, and see what the moth did. And he found out 16 out of 20 times the moth continued on up and went through the hoop. He concluded that the moth doesn't use a nemataxis to do this. It was a chemotactic response to the concentration and whether they were feeling uh, contact with the pheromone molecules or not. He very clearly was aware of J.S. Kennedy's 1939 paper and using a treadmill to try to get the moths, see if they're watching the floor pattern underneath them. He said they tried that, but there was no response from the males, so therefore that cast doubt on them using a nematexas. So they did try. He was well aware of a nematexas. He speculated that at least for coming back into the plume, he didn't know about the longitudinal up or down the plume, how they did that, but that from side to side, they must be sensing a drop in concentration or filament frequency when they go out of the plume to the side and they execute a turn back in, a chemotactic turn back to where the concentration was higher. And this was um, to people in the field like, oh my gosh, how did he think to do this? I mean, his, he was way ahead in asking questions about behavior. Now, John Kennedy, who discovered and described optimotor nematexas in 1939, uh, read this paper, and he came to life back in England. And he did an experiment that basically, to the rest of us in the field, blew Harry's findings out of the water and showed that moths do follow rotating ground patterns. You can move them up and down the tunnel. And that, an amazing thing, he took the pheromone plume away and saw that when the moths fly in clean air, they turn back and forth when there's no pheromone at all. So they're not doing a chemotaxis at all. And it was, uh, I remember all of us reading this paper and, and we're going, good grief, what's Harry think about this and how um, devastated is he by this? But he wasn't devastated, he kept going and promoted chemotaxis for quite a long time. Harry and Wendell won the Von Humboldt Award in 1977. It was a huge award. This was Shorey's research group in 1978. Charlie Lynn, Lou Biosted, and uh, they went on to good careers in entomology, one at uh, in Cornell and Lou at uh, Colorado State. Harry kept working on disruption here with a nematode. Uh, sex pheromone of a nematode and seeing if you get an anti-helminthic uh, uh, control paper in science. Then suddenly, at the peak of all of this activity, Harry suddenly resigns and moves to Washington State to grow flowers. People would write him, he would never reply. Phone him, never answer. He cut himself off completely from his colleagues. Even Wendell, Wendell would try to communicate, never get a response from Harry in Washington. People speculated, what was it that made Harry suddenly leave? And some people just said, well, he's impetuous, he's impulsive, and something made him leave. And maybe he was optimistic about his new, he had just gotten remarried, he was really happy, optimistic about his new life with his new wife. Uh, maybe some people said he had gotten passed over for the chairmanship at Riverside, which he really wanted. He was head of the Division of Biological Control, but apparently people knew he really wanted to be chair at Riverside. And he got passed over, which some people said really hurt him a lot. So for whatever reason, he left and made that opening for me. 
Nobody could contact him. In the meantime, Wendell went on to receive the Wolf Prize in Agriculture, which was considered the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Agriculture, and then got the National Medal of Science. And people, I would have to argue that uh, if Harry had stayed in, they, just like the Von Humboldt Award, he probably would have uh, been a co-recipient of these uh, with Wendell. They were that much of a team, East Coast, West Coast, one with chemistry, one with behavior, but he didn't. Wendell decided one time, he, he couldn't get in contact with Harry, so he just drove, while he was on the West Coast, he drove out to Vashon Island, found his address, looked him up, surprised him, and this is the one photo from that period of time. When uh, Harry started his own business, Daisy's Garden Greenhouse and Nursery on Vashon Island. I now know that a good part of the reason Harry uh, left was he had, he had a second chance for a second family. And he and Ellie, his new wife, adopted two little girls. And this is one of them. This is Jennifer Shorey. I think he was really happy. And it's another photo of, of Jennifer. Meantime, I'm back in Harry's lab. and. Uh, conducting one of my usual scintillating lab meetings. <laughs> and that's his old lab, that's some of his old lab benches. And one thing I'm happy I was able to do was I built a new wind tunnel, Harry's old one I didn't think was good enough. So I, I built a new wind tunnel. And then I followed up on Harry's experiment with stopping the wind with this new wind tunnel, big one. And I did put a twist on it that, and I was a, we were able to stop the wind and get the moths that have started flying upwind. Uh, the, if they're in a pheromone plume in wind, as in the top, um, they fly up naturally all the way to the source, left to right, as you see it. But I was able to, it's a long wind tunnel, so we were able to get the plume to go halfway down, uh, pull the plume, and get clean air to go halfway down and then stop the wind. And the male that had started flying up wind, as you can see in the bottom, was able to keep going in zero wind. But when they got to the front end where there was clean air, they started casting wider and wider and wider, even though there was no wind. So this determined that all of those turns are not anemotactically guided. They're not chemotactically guided because there's no chemical there. So there's, we found there was an internal program of self-steered zigzagging that when the amount of time since pheromone was lost increases and the more seconds go by, the, these turns get less and less frequent and the counter-turning program slows down. Now John Kennedy, I had a lot of correspondence with him after this paper, he was so happy and he said he wished he could tell Harry how glad he was that our experiments had verified that there is another mechanism besides anemotaxis. And he, many of his, uh, his letters to me said, I wish I could tell him in person. And, and John Kennedy also felt maybe he was responsible for this devastating science paper. Maybe it had crushed Harry so much that he got discouraged and then quit science. I had to tell him, no, no that's not true. You don't, know, you don't know Harry. He's unsinkable. But John Kennedy was worried about that, and I was able to tell him, no, that wasn't a thing. But he was very happy that in Harry's old lab, I had done the experiment that kind of showed Harry was right to a certain degree. There was another thing besides a nemotaxis. And this is a chapter Bill Hansen and I wrote that's going to come out in a great new book by Ring Carde and Jeremy Allison. And this just illustrates uh, the, the section you're looking down on a moth brain, how the, the neuroethology, the understanding the olfactory pathways of the, from the antenna to the mushroom body to the lateral protocerebrum, how we think we now know how where optomotor anemotaxis, the integration of visual and, and olfactory information is integrated in the lateral protocerebrum and somewhere in the mushroom body as well. And then 
the lateral accessory lobes, these two things just below the central complex, that's where the counter turning program, the tick tocking, flip flopping circuit uh, is gone. And all this research by John Hildebrand, Ryohei Kanzaki, and others around the world have built on this. But it started with understanding the behavior of a flying moth, which Harry Shorey started with his wind tunnel experiments. Oops. This is the new book. I think Harry would be really happy with this book, Pheromone Communication in Moths, and it's a, going to be a beautiful book. Many, many nice chapters in here. Summarizing all these things that have happened since Harry started working on uh, moth pheromones. Coming out in 2016. Harry came back to Riverside all of a sudden. He showed up in my office in 1984. He had driven up, came to my office, and his business had gone under. And he was leaving Washington to come back and he was looking for a job. He, was, he asked if, if I had a postdoc that I could offer him. Okay. This is the man. This is, he was going to take care of his family. And he would come back to his old lab and he would do a postdoc with me in his old lab if he needed to in order to start making money for his family. His business had gone under. We had Harry and his daughter Jennifer over to our house for dinner that night. And I played piano and he and Jennifer uh, danced in our living room and Ellie was there and everybody was happy. Harry took a postdoc with George Giorgio for six months and he got back on his feet. When he came to my lab, I said, Harry, I've been saving these, I've been saving all your reprints and your books and uh, you've finally come back I've, and, and here they are. He said, no, nah, I don't want them. I don't need them, Tom. They're yours. I'm never going to use them again. Okay. So he became director at the Kearney Agricultural Center. Started a second part of his career. Dave Wood helped him get going on this. He became a research entomologist, not a faculty member, uh, a 100% research, research entomologist, and did amazing research on dried fruit, uh, pest control, innovative ways to put the dates out in the heat so that it would drive the knitted doula beetles out of them, uh, not using insecticides, all sorts of really neat things. And he finally came back to Riverside as a research entomologist in 1995. When I was chair at Riverside in 1988 to 1992, we had a chance, we battled with Davis to see who was going to get Harry Shorey. He was at Parlier, but we wanted Harry associated with Riverside. But Davis, Berkeley beat him out first, and then Davis beat him out in 1993, beat Riverside out. Then he finally came back to Riverside. The last thing I just want to talk about, he kept going with these widely spaced disruption dispensers. And he came out with this aerosol canister that sprayed onto a pad. And at the same time, I had been working, uh, starting in Riverside, I got the idea, and then I moved to uh, Iowa State, and I made these misters, aerosol cans on, on, on the pads work. And we did lots of field experiments. In the meantime, Harry was doing field experiments in the early 90s with his puffers, the same thing, independently uh, found. And ours was like this, and we had them going on corn and then on, on cranberries and uh, showing that these widely spaced dispensers that emitted a huge amount of pheromone could disrupt mating 100%, reduce damage. All the things that Harry found way back in 1974 about widely spaced dispensers, Harry was doing the same thing. We, talk, we, gave, the same, we gave a talk in 1995, um, and we were back to back, and we were each announcing our novel dispensers. And I talked to him for the first time. It was at the ESA meeting in 1995. And finally, he would never, I, I had tried calling him when we first, I found out through Jocelyn Miller that, hey, he's working on the same thing you're working on at Iowa State. You should call him. So I called him, never heard anything. 
I had talked to this one guy on the phone, I don't know who it was, the first time I called, I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm working on this aerosol dispenser that uh, sprays onto a pad, and uh, I heard that Harry Shorey might be working on it. And then it was like, it wasn't Harry, but it was some guy, a postdoc. There was just click. <laughs> it was like, uh-oh. Okay, and I said, Harry, at the 1995 meeting, I said, Harry, how come you never returned my calls? How come you never talked to me about your, uh, your dispensers? This is after our talks. And he said, well, Tom, you know, I had one of those things sitting on my desk for decades. And I was worried about patent considerations and everything. I said, yeah, I know they're not patentable because Tom Payne said there was a bark beetle guy, 1975, who was using this. So Harry said, uh, yeah, I was afraid of uh, the patent uh, thing. And I'm thinking, well, if you had it sitting on your desk for so long, how come you never used it? But at any rate, we came up with the same thing, and he took it to the limit. He had papers with puffers on, on walnuts and his coddling moth, platinode, on all different crops. And he moved them, some of these, on beet army worm, he was able to get these dispensers almost one per square mile, I mean one per square mile on row crops and still get mating disruption. He was really creative, really amazing. He just took it tremendously. So I was just leaving Riverside in 1992 and I went back, even though I was at Iowa State, I went back to work with the Date Packers Association to put my misters I'd been doing, we'd done years of research using hollow fibers on dates to disrupt the carob moth. And we now said, okay, now we're gonna put the misters up in the canopy, 70 feet high. And we're gonna try to disrupt. Harry Shorey wasn't back at Riverside yet, but when he came back in 1995, and I was not there, he continued working on carob moth in the date gardens in Coachella Valley. and his experiments were working. And um, so then this came in uh, 1998. We got news, tragic accident, claims Harry Shorey, and uh, a young boy, teenager, friend of the family. It happened in Coachella Valley. I know the date gardens he was going to, because I went to those date gardens many times. I know the intersection where the accident must have happened, and it was a dangerous intersection. And it was a tragic, tragic time. So before that, in the mid-90s, I had been rooting around in these old files, way in the back. I was looking for something. and. There was this folder, two folders. One had all these scribbles on it, and there's another one with a bunch of typed book chapters. And that on this, both folders had this love at first sniff on the, on the folders. And I looked through it, and it was an unfinished manuscript by Harry Shorey. And I'm going, oh my gosh. Okay, I'm gonna surprise Harry. At some point, I'm going to be at a meeting. I'm gonna give him his book, because I've saved this, just like the other things. Okay, Harry, I saved this for you. Maybe you want it back. And I don't know if he would have. This had amazing chapter titles. Origin of the Kiss, Rise and Fall of the Sensuous Bath, A Time for Love, General Stimulating Effects of Odor, et cetera. There was like 20 chapters. And I'm just showing you the titles. And then all of the other, there's a huge file of all the notes he had made and all of the reprints he was making notes from. He was going to write this book. But he died, and I never had a chance to give him this chapter. And I carried it around. I carried it to Penn State. I carried it around. And I've got it with me now. And I can't give it to you, Harry, but I thought I would give it to Jennifer Shorey, who has come to this meeting, and she's sitting somewhere in the audience. Jennifer, if you would please come up here. 
I, I met, the only other time I met Jennifer was in 1984 when she, you saw the picture and she was a toddler. This is the first time and uh, she was so generous. She wanted to come here. Harry Shorey, thank you very much for listening.